Alrighty, good afternoon, lads and ladies. Welcome back to Health 2. We are going to get rolling with some more volume stuff today. Um, so give me just a moment, get the dot cam fired up, and we'll get to it. Paper here for today. Hopefully that will get the job done. I wanted to say uh, while I'm while I'm getting this going here that uh, I've had some visitors in office hours from this class, and that makes me really happy. I want to encourage you guys to continue coming to office hours, and anybody who hasn't done so, please consider dropping by one. It's a really great setting for us to talk about problems where I can be more specific about the things that you want to know. It's just it's a it's a special environment. I know it's weird in Zoom, um, but I want you guys to to take a chance on it, and please consider coming by an office hour, even if you don't have a particular problem you want to discuss, just so you can see kind of uh, what my workflow is like and talk with other people about solving problems in a setting that's a little less intimidating than, than the full-on class here. Um, so this is, of course, Mac 2312, section 004. It's a lecture. And today is the 14th of January, 2021. Today, we will be, um, we'll do a one or two more 6.2 problems. More disk washer stuff. Um, section 6.2. But then the big game is we are going to learn a new method, the cylindrical shells method. from section 6.3. Um, my Calc 2 professor, and this I'll never forget it, said this, he called the cylindrical shells method the onion method for reasons that will become evident down the line. And he said, it's like an onion in the sense that as you peel it, it will make you cry. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but um, I want to alert you to the joke because this does require your full attention. We will be thinking geometrically, uh, which is not necessarily something we, we are all used to doing all the time. Uh, so I, I just want to share the joke with you because it's been funny to me ever since and, um, and warn you a little bit that you know, geometry is inbound. So uh, disk washer problems, I would be happy to do whatever disk washer problems you guys would like as uh, remaining examples from section 6.2. They can be problems from the book, problems from the homework. Uh, let me know in the chat what you guys want to look at. I will remind you really quickly. One second here. This is our disk washer Bible. If this did not get into your notes, consider taking a screenshot. Um, make sure you get this down. This is everything you need for the disk washer method. We, we finished with this last time. Um, to find a volume using the disk washer method, the steps were first, sketch the region. And the axis of rotation. Second, draw your strip. And the strip is always perpendicular to the axis of rotation for this method. That's the magic. Then you imagine rotating just the strip. This will generate the little solid with volume dv. Oops, sorry about that. Generate our little solid with volume dv. Uh, and then we need to identify big R and little r according to the rules here. Uh, and then you integrate dv integrate that little differential volume to find V, the volume of the full solid. Um, but really, all the magic is in this purple stuff here. You have to remember how to find big R 
how to find little r. That's the hard stuff. Once you have those, in terms of the appropriate variable, you plug them into this formula. Remember that dt will always be one of dx or dy, depending on the problem. If your axis of rotation is horizontal, then you're going to draw your strip perpendicular to that, meaning a vertical strip. So its little thickness will be a dx thickness. And if the axis of rotation is vertical, your strip will be drawn perpendicular to that, which means its tiny little thickness will be a tiny little dy thickness. Alrighty. So again, screenshot if you don't have this in your notes already, and then we are going to solve just one more disk washer problem. What would you guys like to solve? Here your homework. This is one that I just did with somebody in office hours, but we can do any one of these. Can we do seven? Sure, let's do it. Six, seven. Is that? Oh, yeah, that is this one. Okay. So, homework two. As an example, homework two, problem seven. Uh, here we want to find find the volume, blah, blah, blah. I won't write all the words. Find the volume of the solid generated by rotating the region bounded by the curves. Y equals three cos x. Y equals three sine x zero less than or equal to x, less than or equal to pi over four, about the line, what did we have here? Is it negative one? Yeah, y equals negative one. So our first step is to sketch the region, and you need to do this by hand. I know that WebAssign lets you pick from a bunch of pictures, and you can just stare at those pictures, but you need to do this by hand. Trust me. Please just trust me. So we're going to draw the graphs of 3 cos x and 3 sin x. Um, now, normally I would draw, if I was graphing these, I'd graph them from like 0 to 2 pi or something. But let me, let me just graph these from like 0 to, um, I'm just going to go 0 to pi over 2. All right. And you know that the sine of zero is zero. I'll label this as three and this as negative three. The sine of zero is zero. So this curve starts off at the origin. And the sine of pi over two, if you plug pi over two in there, is one. So at pi over two, he's all the way up here at three. Um, and that's the turning point for the sine function, right? So the sine function kind of looks like this here. And the cosine function, you plug in 0 to cos x, you get 1. So he starts all the way up here. I'll, I'll draw a little bit more of the sine function so you get a feel for what I'm doing. The cosine function starts up here, and we'll get to 0 by there. So he's going to look something like this. And then he would continue down, right? turning around eventually. This is y equals 3 sine x, y equals 3 cos x. I'm zooming in on the interval in question, right? That's the vibe. The place where these guys meet, of course, is pi over 4. So the region in question is this region. And I'm going to rotate all this around the line y equals negative 1, which I'll do my best to draw in here, albeit not quite to scale. So I'm going to take that region and spin them around like this. OK, is everybody comfy with these graphs? I know they're, they're not perfect, but are we comfortable with why the graphs look the way they do? Are there any questions about how I got those curves? OK. 
I've sketched my region and my axis of rotation. What's my next step? Um, the little you got a thing that you draw um, with the little thickness. Yeah, we need to draw in our little differential thickness strip. Does the strip go in up and down like this, or does it go in left and right like this? It should be perpendicular to the y equals negative one. Very good, perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So my axis of rotation is this line, which means my strip needs to go in perpendicular to it like this, because that's what makes the disk washer method the disk washer method. So here is my little differential thickness strip. We understand that the width of this strip is dx. I should, I should say that the strip is in here at an arbitrary x value. So I'm going to think of everything here as a function of x. The point along this lower curve here is x comma 3 sine of x. And the point up here along this upper curve is x comma 3 cos of x. So now I've got my strip in. It's, it's a, you know, perpendicular to the axis of rotation drawn into my region. So now I need to imagine rotating just that strip. And this is the drawing part that gets hard for me. So I, I apologize if this Art is not good. Okay, if I rotate just that little blue strip around the axis of rotation, I will get something looking like this, yeah? All right, there's my best art. I'll draw in the axis of rotation here just to help us with visualizing what's going on. Right, this is my axis of rotation. So the volume of this tiny little solid is dV. That's the little volume that I need to find and integrate to recover V. In order to find the volume of this little solid, I need to know a few things. I need to know how thick is the little solid and what is the area of a cross section of that little solid. In other words, I need to know this dimension. I need to know this dimension, which I call little r. And I need to know this dimension, which I call big R. Right, so the radius of the little punched out bit in the middle, that's what we call little r. The radius of the whole thing from the center all the way out to the edge, that's what we call big R. And this thickness is dx. Right, because this strip's thickness is a tiny little horizontal shift. That's a, a dx shift. I need to know what is big R and what is little r. And since this is a dx, I need them as functions of x. So we come back to the picture up here and we try to label some distances as big R and little r. Remember from the thing I showed a second ago, our little disk washer Bible, that little r is always the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So because this strip is perpendicular to this axis, one part of the strip is closer than the other part of the strip. The closer part of the strip is this guy, right? This is the near end of the strip, the end of the strip that is closer to the axis of rotation. So that distance, is little r, the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And this distance 
is big R, the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation. So who can help me out in terms of calculation? And um, I know Josh and Alexander just saw this in, in office hours. So somebody besides those two, can you tell me what is little r? It seems like it would be um, three sine x plus one. That's exactly correct. We take the y value here, which is three sine x, and we subtract the y value here. So little r is three sine of x minus negative one, which is three sine of x plus one. All right, and could I get another brave volunteer for big R? What is the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation? What is this distance here? Three cosine x plus one. Thank you, thank you very much. Who was that? I don't want to single anybody out, just-, just Maya. Maya, thank you, Maya. All right, so this would be three cos of x minus negative one, which is three cos of x plus one. So then dv, the volume of my tiny little solid here is pi times big R squared minus little r squared times dx. And we cooked that up last time. We can be comfy with and remember that recipe. It'll be useful in all of these problems. I plug in what I've got. Uh, I'm going to need some more space, so I'll come over here. dv is pi times open big parentheses. Big R is 3 cos x plus 1. So big R squared is 3 cos x plus one quantity squared. Don't forget the parentheses. Minus little r squared, which is three sine x plus one quantity squared and dx is dx. All right, we're almost through the hard part. <clears throat> In order to recover v, I need to integrate dv. I need to choose my bounds in order to set up that integral. This volume is going to be a, a number, which means that the integral we're going to use to calculate it needs to be a definite integral. So how do I figure out my bounds? Be, don't just give me the answer, please, but tell me how I find them. You set the two equations equal to each other? Not necessarily, no. That will find for you intersection points. And in this case, one of those intersection points is a bound, but the other bound does not come from an intersection. Um, so if I was looking for places where the curves touched, sometimes those are bounds. But in this case, that's not really it. I'm looking for something a little bit different, I'm looking for something that talks about this region. The restricted domain, the zero, like how x is in between zero and pi over four. Yeah, in this case, the problem gave it to us. They told us we're interested in x's that are between zero and pi over four. Now, in general, what we need to do is ask, what is the smallest x value in this region? And what is the largest x value in this region? In other words, you have to imagine this strip as moving through this region. So what x value puts this strip at the far left side of this region? And what x value puts this strip at the far right side of this region? Over here, x is 0. And over here, x is pi over 4. So you always have to imagine the strip sliding through your region. For every location that this strip could be at, you have another little washer. And your solid comes from stacking all those washers. So our bounds are always the smallest x, or maybe y value, depending on how the problem is set up in your region, to the largest x or maybe y value in your region, depending on the, on the problem. So v is the integral from x equals 0 to x equals pi over 4 of dv. And I like to write the variable here to remind me like where those are coming from, that those are x values. But then when we go to do the calculation, uh, it's really not necessary. You can just write 0 to pi over 4. And then my integrand, the thing I'm integrating, 
is pi times paren paren, three cos x plus one squared minus paren three sine x plus one all squared dx. And when you get this far, you should celebrate, right? That's the hardest part of these problems. But in general, in mathematics, integrals are fucking hard. So how do I do this integral? Anybody had success on these? Wouldn't you plug in zero and pi over four? Well, first I have to find an antiderivative. I, after I find an antiderivative, then I can plug in zero and pi over four. But the remember the, the way we solve a definite integral is you find an antiderivative, then evaluate between bounds. And the hard step there is the antiderivative. So let me. Can we use um, u substitution for this? I don't think so. Although on some of these problems, you certainly can use u sub. I don't see a clear inner and outer function in my integrand, uh, nor do I see like uh, something that I, I want to make like go away or relabel as a single variable. So I don't think this is a u sub problem. Um, I think there might be some kind of um, half angle formula when we distribute the square. There we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to foil everything out, and then there will be a trig identity that's used. So 3 cos x plus 1 all squared is 9 cos squared x plus 6 cos x plus 1. This is what I get when I foil that first piece. And from that, I need to subtract what I get when I foil the second piece, which is 9 sine squared x plus 6 sine x plus 1. So first we just blow the thing up algebra-wise. And now I'm going to combine pieces that feel like they belong together. The constants surely belong together. This 6 sine x and this 6 cos x look like they should talk to each other. And uh, 9 cos squared is a close friend of 9 sine squared. So let's put those together. So I still have pi out front, integral 0 to pi over 4. And now I'm just going to distribute this negative and regroup terms. I'll have 9 times cos squared x minus 9 times sine squared x plus 6 times cos x minus 6 times sine x, and then plus 1, minus 1, those go away. Those eat each other up. Down the road, uh, two weeks from now, I will show you how to integrate cos squared on its own. I will show you how to integrate sine squared on its own. But right now, uh, you guys don't know how to do that. Um, uh, I think that's nine, nine, nine times cosine of 2x. Yeah, there we go. So this is what we're going to need here. And then there will eventually be a little u sub. So my u sub person, we're going to have some fun with that too. Uh, from here, I would advise splitting up the integral. So first, let me, I'll show you the, I'm going to do some factoring. We'll call this pi times integral 0 to pi over 4. Uh, big bracket, 9 times cos squared x minus sine squared x. And that's where the double angle identity that was just mentioned by Alejandro is going to come into play. This is the same as cosine of 2x plus 6 times parentheses cos x minus sine x. Close paren, close bracket, dx. <coughs> Now I'll split up the integral. 9 pi integral 0 to pi over 4 cos squared x 
minus sine squared x dx plus six pi integral zero to pi over four cos x minus sine x dx. The second integral is easy. You know an antiderivative for cosine, and you know an antiderivative for sine. So you know an antiderivative for this guy. The first guy here, though, he requires a double angle identity. So you may remember back on day one, I gave you guys a list of trig identities that we're going to use often in this class. And one of them was the double angle identity for the cosine function. Cos 2x is cos squared x minus sine squared x. So this piece is cos 2x. So my last step before I actually do some integration here is 9 pi integral 0 to pi over 4 cosine of 2x dx plus 6 pi integral 0 to pi over 4 cos x minus sine x dx. All right, now it's time for the good stuff. This is a little u sub problem. So in here, I will substitute z equals 2x, which means dz is 2 dx. In other words, this dx right here is one half of dz. I also need to change my bounds. My old lower bound, x equals 0. If you plug in 0 for x here, you'll find z is equal to 2 times 0, <clears throat> which is still 0. And when x is equal to pi over 4, z will be equal to 2 times pi over 4, which is pi over 2. This I split the integrals because I'm doing this substitution only in this piece. This piece does not require the substitution, so it's important you split up the integrals. So that first piece will become 9 pi integral 0 to pi over 2 cosine of z times 1 half dz. And this 1 half is coming from this 2. If dz is equal to 2 times dx, then dx is equal to 1 half dz. So this 1 half dz is dx. Then cosine of z, of course, is cosine of 2x because z is 2x, and my bounds have changed according to these rules. Over here, I still have my plus 6 pi integral 0 to pi over 4 cos x minus sine x dx. And now I'm ready for an antiderivative. My first integral, I can pop out the 1 half, and I'll have 9 pi over 2. An antiderivative for the cosine of z is sine of z. So I'll have here the sine of z evaluated between these bounds, not the old bounds, between the new bounds. Those are the bounds for z. So the first integral looks like this. The second integral is easier. We didn't have to do any substitution. So when we cook up our antiderivative, antiderivative for cos x is sine x. And then I have minus an antiderivative for sine x. Well, an antiderivative for sine x is negative cos x. So the two negatives eat each other up. You get sine x plus cos x. And this one is evaluated from 0 
to pi over four. Finally, it's time to plug in the bounds. And for all its work in this guy, let's see what we get. If I plug in pi over two, the sine of pi over two is one. So here I'll have nine pi over two bracket one minus, when I plug in the lower bound, I get zero. The sine of zero is zero. And then plus six pi. I need to plug in my upper bound, pi over four. So I'll put each piece here in parens. The sine of pi over four is root two over two, plus the cos of pi over four is also root two over two. And I need to subtract from that what I get when I plug in zero. The sine of zero is zero, plus the cos of zero is one. So here we have our answer. It's not written in a pretty fashion, but it is our answer, and we can clean it up quite a bit. Nine pi over two times one minus zero is nine pi over two. And then plus six pi times root two over two plus root two over two is two root two over two, which is just the square root of two. Minus zero plus one, that's a minus one. And for my money, this is about as pretty as it gets. You can factor out a pi if you want, you can distribute and combine things however you like, um, but I would just leave it like this. I would call it nine pi over two plus six pi times the square root of two minus one. And that is the game. So I'll zoom out a little bit. I'll give a few seconds for people to write and then we can take questions on any of these steps. Pay careful attention to the substitution step and all of the algebra work that comes before. Okay. How do we feel? Questions, comments, concerns? Um, I feel like a snow globe when it's been shaken, but um, I'm overall, I made it out ahead and I got the answer to the question. Cheers. This is, this is not, a bad, not a bad result. I got a question. Why didn't we change the bounds on the second half of the, the six pi? Why are the bounds still? So yeah, why no bound change here? Because I'm only making the substitution in the first integral. That's why I split the integrals up. This one requires a u sub. This one does not. So I didn't make any substitutions. You notice I'm not using the variable z here. I'm using the variable x still. So all the way from this step down to this step, I don't do anything with that second integral. I'm just copying it down. I'm really only working on this first integral with that substitution. So in this one, I made the substitution z equals 2x, and that gave me this integral. This guy from here to here, I just left him alone. I didn't do anything with him because I know how to do that integral without a substitution. OK. But good, good questions. And that's we have to split it up in order to make that go, right? Um, I don't. I really don't want to make that substitution in this integral. That would make this guy harder. So only this one benefits from the substitution. So that's why I split these two up and handle them separately. What else are we thinking? I'm sure there are other questions. So do you want only questions before we get to the cylinder method? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, just, just questions on this problem for now and after we are 100% comfy with this, I will introduce the cylindrical shells method. Okay, I feel you. I got a quick question. Yeah, Albert. The, the reason we can just pick an arbitrary 
X value for our uh, strip because where that strip is where we pick it, it's not the same size all the way through the area. Exactly. That's the reason exactly. Yep. we can do that is because we're incorporating the function of each line that creates the uh, area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, over here, if X is close to pi over four, that strip is very short. And over here, if X is close to zero, that strip is almost height three. So I have to figure out what are all of these dimensions as a function of X, where X is allowed to run from anywhere between zero to pi over four. This is a moving strip. Yeah. In addition, um, I think that number six could be a good one to go over, just because it's got some sequence and manipulation around non-axis lines. Um, also so number nine, if you have chance. Six and nine. Yeah, thank you. Let's take a look at nine. Maybe we can do one of these. Nine is a, a no, problem. Ten, it ten. really isn't much Sorry, like this. 10 is gonna be a cylindrical yeah. shell problem. So don't worry about 10. We can take a quick look at number six. So nine, there's the only one problem like that on the set and it's a critical thinking problem. So I don't wanna spoil it for you, but I would be happy to show you the setup for number six here. Um, I'm not going to do the whole problem number six. So I need to preserve some time to do the cylindrical shells method stuff. But six from homework two, find the volume. Y equals three plus secant X. Y equals five. And we're just interested in what goes on between negative pi over three and pi over three. We're rotating about the line y equals three. <clears throat> okay. Imagine exam one is today, and there's only one problem. Sketch the graph of the secant function. How many would get 100%? All right. Depends on how much time I'd have to think about it. <laughs> so just for fun, let's play this game. We haven't played this here. Well, you know sine and cosine. These are our buddies. Here's secant. Let me delete sine for a second. Secant and cosine are friends. Right, secant is the reciprocal of cosine. So where cosine is zero, secant is undefined. Where cosine is one, secant is one. Where cosine is negative one, secant is negative one. Uh, some people remember the graph of secant by sketching the graph of cosine and then sketching the graph of secant kind of on top of it like this. This is the graph of secant and we need to know it. These aren't parabolas, but they kind of look like parabolas and that sometimes helps people remember. But this is what secant looks like. So I need to sketch 3 plus secant x, which means I need to take this graph and move everything up by 3 units. So good old fashioned secant is equal to 1 when x is 0. So three plus secant, uh, let me actually, let's do it like this. Three plus secant is equal to four when X is zero. And it has these misbehaviors at pi over two and negative pi over two. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna draw three plus secant We have these vertical asymptotes at pi over two and negative pi over two. Draw three plus secant looking like this. So this y-intercept right here would be four, right? Because 
secant of zero is one, one plus three is four. I'll call this up here five, because y equals five is one of my boundary curves. I need to draw in the horizontal line y equals five. So my region is this. And I want to rotate about the line y equals three. So down here, I'm going to call this three. I know things aren't perfectly to scale. But you label everything, and it's all right. So here's my region and my axis of rotation. Step one done. Um, I need to know how to draw in my strip next. So my strip, is it going to be up, down like this, or left, right like this? It has to be up, down. Good, yeah, yeah. Perpendicular to the axis of rotation, always for the disk washer. So here's my little differential thickness strip. Since it's oriented vertically like this, its thickness is a little dx thickness. I need to characterize the points along this curve that tell me the height of the strip. So this point right here would be x comma 3 plus secant x. Because it's along the graph y equals secant x. We're imagining this is all taking place at an arbitrary x value. And the point up here at the far end of my strip would be just x comma 5, because we're along the graph there, y equals 5. So here's the picture we need to set up uh, the volume problem in question. dv as always, for the disk washer method is pi times big R squared minus little r squared. And in this case, the differential is dx because my strip has a little x thickness. Big R and little r are the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. That's little r and the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation, that's big R. So I've sketched these in. Here's big R and here is little r. We need formulas. I need to know what is big R, what is little r. One of these is not too bad. Big R is constant. Big R is just five, because no matter where this strip is, even if the strip was over here, the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation is always just five, no matter where that strip is. If it were here, it's still five. Over here, far end, axis of rotation, it's just, oh, I'm sorry, it's not five. What is it? Yeah, it's not five. Mm -hmm. I was I was about to say. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What is big R? It's not two. It is two. Yeah, correct. Good, good, good. Right? It's the y value here minus the y value here. So it's the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation. My axis of rotation is the line y equals three. So this is five minus three, which is two. All right, what about little r? Three plus secant, secant of x minus three. Beautiful. Take the y value here, which is three plus secant x, minus the y value here, which is three. So that's three plus secant x minus three, uh, which is just the secant of x. Now there's one thing we haven't done. It's time to find my bounds. And in this case, who is the individual who said we should set curves equal to each other to find bounds? This time that's true. I need to integrate from whatever the x value is over here 
to whatever the x value is over here. To do that, I need to set this curve, y equals 5, equal to this curve, y equals 3 plus secant x. So let me call this number here a, the x value here. Let me call the x value over here b. Before I find these, before I go through the work to discover these, I want to point out that they kind of told us already. You could use some lecture logic to deduce that this probably is pi over 3, and this probably is negative pi over 3, because why the fuck else would they say this? But if we want to really be careful about it, to find a and b, we must solve 5 equals 3 plus secant x. And I'm going to do this just because it's a good exercise. It's good working with trig functions. So how do I solve that equation? I think some of you took trig with me. You subtract 3 from s? Yeah, we need to subtract 3 from both sides. So over here, I've got a 5. I'm sorry if my handwriting does that look like an s. I'll subtract 3 from both sides, and that gives me 2 equals secant of x. OK, what now? Draw a unit circle. We can draw the unit circle. There's one more step I would consider before that. I would take reciprocals on both sides. I would say this is the same as saying 1 half is equal to the reciprocal of secant, which is cosine of x. Why not just use the unit circle to find secant directly? You can, if you're comfy with that. But I've found that a lot of people struggle remembering even just the sines and cosines on the unit circle. So whenever possible, I like to do things the simplest way. But if you are comfy finding secants from the unit circle directly, rather than thinking in terms of sines and cosines, you absolutely can do that. It's a good move. Um, but for those of us who are not super comfy finding secants and tangents directly from the unit circle, you can convert this into a cosine equation, right? just by taking reciprocals. So I need to find the two values on the unit circle nearest to 0, one of them negative, one of them positive, such that the cosine of that angle is equal to 1 half. And if you remember, here's 1 half. The angle up here, which takes us to the point 1 half comma root 3 over 2, this angle is pi over 3. And the angle down here, that would get us to 1 half comma uh, negative root 3 over 2. We have to think of it in this way as negative pi over 3. I'm not interested in rotating all the way around. That would find me another solution somewhere over here, where the line y equals 5 hits my graph. I want the smallest negative solution. So I have to think about rotating down on my unit circle, some rotating some negative angle. So. These really are x equals negative pi over 3 and x equals positive pi over 3. There's infinitely many solutions to this equation. I want to be clear about that, right? Um, 5 pi over 3 is a solution to this equation. Uh, you take either pi over 3 and negative pi over 3 and add any multiple of 2 pi, you'll get another solution to that equation. Quick Desmos time. Uh, secant x, 3, oh, 3 plus secant x, y equals 5. You see a shitload of solutions, right? These are the ones we want, negative pi over 3 and pi over 3. But you could find lots and lots more, like 5 pi over 3, 7 pi over 3, 11 pi over 3. There's plenty of solutions. But since we are working in this region, these are the two that I want. And those are the two we found through the unit circle. So we're ready to set this up. B 
is equal to the integral from negative pi over three to positive pi over three of dv. dv is, so this is integral negative pi over three to positive pi over three of pi times parentheses, big R squared, which is two squared minus little r squared, which is secant of x squared dx. A quick note, you can exploit some symmetries here. Notice that my region is symmetric about zero. This is an even function that I'm integrating. So I could call this, I'll pop out the pi, but then I'll multiply by two and say that same as two pi integral zero to pi over three of this thing, which is four minus secant squared of x dx. And that symmetry game is a nice one. It's a, a useful fact. If you integrate an even function, which is continuous um, from negative a to a, you can just do the integral from zero to a and multiply by two. An antiderivative for four is easy to find. That's four x. What is an antiderivative per secant squared? Tangent. Good. The tangent function differentiates to secant squared. So this is four x minus the tangent of x evaluated from zero to pi over three. And I'll go ahead and finish it since we're so close. At the upper bound, I'll have 4 pi over 3 minus the tangent of pi over 3. And at the lower bound, I'll have 4 times 0 minus the tangent of 0. Just for fun, what is the tangent of 0? Zero? 0. Good. All right. So there ain't shit coming from this lower bound. What is the tangent of pi over three? Two over two root three. So let's refer back to our unit circle here. Here's pi over three, right? Tangent should be the y over the x, the sine over the cosine. So tangent of pi over three is the square root of three over two divided by one half, which is just the square root of three, right? It's root three over two times two over one, cancel the twos, you get root three. So this is root three here and that is the whole game. Okay. So I'm going to move now to talking about volumes by cylindrical shells. We only have a little bit of time left. I want to make good use of it. If you want to see this in more detail, of course, you can watch the video afterwards or come by office hours. I'd be happy to work through any problems with you guys there. We need to begin in section 6.3, volumes by cylindrical shells. The whole game here, instead of drawing your strip perpendicular to the axis of rotation, you draw the strip parallel to the axis of rotation. Pretty much everything else is the same. You're going to end up with different formulas because your little differential solid has a different shape. So, a, you know, a different volume. Your dv formula is different, but this has advantages. Imagine I have a curve looking like this. You may recognize this from your homework where you encounter a curve looking like this. For now, let me just call it y equals f of x. And I want to take this region 
and rotate it about the y-axis. If I wanted to set this up using the disk washer method, I would come in here and draw a strip perpendicular to the axis of rotation like this, yeah? Little r would be the distance from here to here, which is a horizontal distance, and big r would be the distance from here to here, which is also a horizontal distance. But how would you find this horizontal distance and this horizontal di distance as a function of f, or as, sorry, as a function of y? You would need to invert the function f and recharacterize those points in terms of the variable y. But if this function is not one to one, then you can't do that. So instead, we say, I will attack this differently. I can still think of my solid as being made up of a bunch of little solids, each one coming from rotating a little strip like this. But now I draw the little strip parallel to my axis of rotation. The point up here is x comma f of x. And if I were to rotate just this little strip, the resulting solid will look like this. I'm, I'm especially bad at drawing these. These are a little hard. Okay. The resulting solid would look like this. I guess if we're looking down from above, we should still be able to see this inner wall a little bit. Oh, this should all be dotted, damn it. All right, whatever, we're drawing it solid, we're drawing it solid, there it goes. Okay, if I were to rotate just that little strip, I would get a little solid looking like this, right? Like here's my little strip seen as the sidewall there. Um, it's a cylindrical shell. It's a hollowed out cylinder, right? So the middle here is all empty. How do you find the volume of this little sun bitch? Well, the easiest way I know of to do this is to imagine you have some very sharp scissors and you come in here and you cut this and unroll it. If I were to cut and unroll that little cylindrical shell. Think of it as like a soup can or something. Very, very thin wall with the tops and bottoms cut off. Then when you cut and unroll it, you'll get a very, very thin walled rectangular prism. Right? That's the, the term for a, a little box in mathematics, we call these rectangular prisms. Right? Now the wall thickness here, the wall thickness here, this is dx. It's the thickness of that strip. So this dimension here, this thickness is dx. The height of my cylindrical shell here, H, is the height of my rectangular prism here. I'll call that H. What is this dimension? That's the distance from um, the origin from the uh, to the strip times two. 
Not quite. So think in terms of this guy. Imagine you're looking straight down from above on this as I cut and unroll it. Pi times h. Getting closer. It's the circumference of the circle. It's the circumference. Two pi r. Yeah, it's the circumference, which is two pi times the radius. So if here's my axis of rotation, the radius of this shell is what tells me that dimension. It's the circumference of the circle. And the circumference of a circle is two pi times the radius. So my volume, my little volume, dv, is height times length times width. Two pi r times h times dx. Now, h is going to be the height of the strip in here. And r is going to be the distance from the strip to the axis of rotation. There is no near or far end of the strip here, because the strip is parallel to the axis of rotation. And then, you know, if this number over here is b, and this number over here is a, in this case, it's 0 then v would be the integral from a to b of dv, the integral from a to b of 2 pi r h dx. And just like in the dishwasher problems, sometimes this all gets turned sideways and all the x's are y's. Um, but the sit setup is always going to be like this. So let me give you a kind of Bible, a cylindrical shell Bible, like we have our dishwasher Bible. And then we will solve a problem or two, okay? What am I doing on time? 133, this is a 1230, 145 talk. We're doing good. So here is the cylindrical shells method. The big thing here is that you draw the strip parallel. Here's the symbol for parallel. Parallel to the axis of rotation. And this means parallel. OK, here dv will always be 2 pi r times h times, I'll use dt again in place of something that could be dy or dx, where r is the radius of the shell, which is the distance from the strip to the axis of rotation. And I want to say again that there's only one of these in the cylindrical shell method. Because the strip is parallel to the axis of rotation, it's not like the top or bottom is further away, right? There's just one distance from the axis of rotation to the strip. H is the height of the strip. And that's all you need. DT is either DX or DY, depending on the problem. Here, if your axis of rotation is vertical, then dt will be dx. And if the axis of rotation is horizontal, d 
dt will be dy. All right, so this is everything you need for the cylindrical shells method. Uh, the picture that comes along with this is the picture I had on the previous page. I won't redraw it here, but let's look at a problem or two. I'll take one from your homework. Some problems can be solved both ways. Some problems can only be solved one way. And this is a great example of a problem that can only be solved using the shells method. Because if you tried to solve this using the disk washer method, you would end up not being able to find big R and little r. They would need to be given as functions of y, but there's no way to invert this function and solve for y because it's not a one-to-one -one function. Let me try something that is a little less conceptually heady so we can sort of wrap our, our brains around it more readily. I'll do number 12. Use shells to find the volume of the solid generated by rotating the region bounded by y equals x cubed, y equals 0, x equals 1, and x equals 2 about the y-axis. So just like the, the good news is the steps I laid out for the disk washing method are the same as the steps for the cylindrical shells method. Don't need to worry about learning a different set of steps. Sketch your region. Y equals X cubed is another graph we should all know well. Shouldn't even have to think about it. Looks like this in the first quadrant. And it does something like this down here in the third. Y equals zero, that is the X axis. Now I'm interested in going here. It looks like X equals one to X equals two. So this is my region. And I want to rotate about the y-axis. So here's step one complete, right? I've got my region sketched, my axis of rotation sketched. Step two, I draw the strip. And for the disk washer method, I'm sorry, disk washer, for the cylindrical shells method, the strip goes in parallel to the axis of rotation. So my axis of rotation is vertical. That means my strip will be oriented vertically like this. The understanding that the thickness of this strip is a dx thickness, and it is at an arbitrary x value between 1 and 2. If I rotate just that strip, I'll try to get you a better drawing here. If I rotate just that strip, it's just so hard for me to picture these. And I will get a little cylindrical shell. Looking like this. Right. which I can imagine cutting and unrolling. It has a height here, h. It has a radius, I'll call r. And if I cut and unroll that strip, or sorry, that shell, uh, 
I will get a very thin, long box. The height of that box is still h. The thickness of that box is dx. And the kind of length of that box is the circumference of the circular shell here, which is 2 pi times the radius, which means my little differential volume, dv, is length times width times height, 2 pi r h dx. So I need to find r and h. And just like when we need to find these things for the disk washer method, we come back to the picture up here. R is the distance from the strip to the axis of rotation. That is this distance. And H is the height of the strip. So what is R? What is H? Here's one thing I didn't do here. I didn't characterize the point on this curve, right? So this is x comma x cubed, because we're along the graph y equals x cubed. Would it just be x? Yeah, good. R is x. What is H? x cubed. Good. So dv is 2 pi x times x cubed dx, which is 2 pi x to the 4 dx, which means b is the integral of dv here taken from x equals 1 to x equals 2 will be 2 pi integral from 1 to 2 x to the 4 dx. And an antiderivative here is not hard. This is 2 pi times x to the 5 over 5 evaluated from 1 to 2. Uh, you can pop out the 5. So that's 2 pi over 5 times 2 to the 5 is 32, minus 1 to the 5 is 1. So that's 2 pi times 31 over 5. So 2 pi over 5 times 31. And you could write that as a 62 pi over 5, if then you wanted to. This is a pretty straightforward shells problem. The shells method has a handful of advantages over the disk washer method. Um, most notably, you don't need your function to be one to one. Um, sometimes, like I said, in these problems, you run into a problem here. Right? If you wanted to find the distances from this guy to the horizontal or to the, to the axis, or this guy to the axis, you would have to solve this for x. Get x in as a function of y. It's not an easy thing to do because this is not a one-to-one -one function. But if you run that same problem, using the method of cylindrical shells, I don't care because I don't need that because I'm just thinking about this height and this distance, right? This height and this radius. So some problems are very hard to set up using the disk washer method and very easy to set up using the shells method. Some problems are impossible to set up using the disk washer method and very easy to set up using the shells method. Sometimes the integrals you get from one, if you can set it up both ways, are easier than the integrals you get from the other. Um, and 
I, I will work with you before the exam on some more examples where it's it's easy to set up one way and easy to set up the other way, but one of the integrals is harder than the other. Uh, in the problem sets, you can usually infer which method to use. Oh, shit, I'm going to have to log back in and log me out based on the on the problem number. So this sort of lecture logic, I don't always want to uh, in, you know, inject or suggest. Oh, this is always happening to me. I hate this shit. So if you see a 6.2 in front of the problem on the problem ID, uh, that's a disk washer problem. If you see a 6.3, then that's coming from the section on cylindrical shells. And uh, it's up to you how you want to attempt these. Right here, you see 6.2, right? That tells you disk washer. Down here, you see 6.3, that tells you cylindrical shells. But any of the 6.3 problems, you could attempt either way. And most of them can be solved both ways. And I encourage you to set them up multiple ways and see if one is looking nicer to you than another. Um, but that is it. That is all I have for you guys on this material. I'll come back here in case anybody needed to write anything down like this. Is there any bit of the notes you want to see again before we call it? Can you go back to the, uh, I forget what you call it, but like the key points of. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our little cylindrical shells Bible here. Yeah, this. Have my disk washer one underneath so we can pair. Oh, hello. Yes, hello. Um, how do we determine quickly, uh, like which one to use, depending on when we first see the question? We should have an idea of how to solve it. Well, you should. So the steps are the same, right? You always sketch the region and the axis of rotation first. So sketch your region and your axis of rotation and then see if one appears easier than the other. It's up to you. You can infer from the problem number, like here it says 6.3.07. That means this problem comes from section 6.3, which is the section on cylindrical shells. Or, you know, oftentimes the problems will tell you explicitly. But if the problem doesn't tell you explicitly, or if you don't want to infer from the section numbers, then you should sketch the region and imagine trying to set it up either way. If one of them feels more natural or feels easier than the other, like doesn't require you solving for Y or solving for X, uh, then go with whatever feels most natural. But many of these problems, almost all of these problems can be done both ways. Uh, so I encourage you to explore either one. There is no right or wrong answer to that. You can do whichever method you feel more comfortable with, unless the problem says use this method. Did you get web assign back up or no? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Was there something you wanted to see in web assign? Yeah, just really quick. Number 10, I don't know if it's just for me or if it's, or if it's for everybody, but the equation on number 10 is like impossible to read. Like really hard. Uh, well, so A is six and B is three. Right, so but it's A sine of what? A sine of BX squared. Okay, I just couldn't read that at all. Thank you. Oh, oh, like hard to hard to physically see. Hold yeah, it's control blurry. on the keyboard and hit plus. Uh, you can zoom sure. in, control on the keyboard and minus will zoom you out. Yeah, if that ever happens again. Control plus, control minus. Very useful. All right, I gotta get running because I've got some other things I need to do. Um, but I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. And if you do want help on any of these problems, you want to talk to me about any of this shit, come by an office hour, shoot me a canvas message, whatever you're most comfy with. Uh, remember, Wait, I do. No have... lab today? Yeah, are we not oh, having a lab? Thursday, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, you guys, we have an extra 75 minute session here. All right, we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back for problem solving, okay? I mean, if you need to do other stuff, I'm sure we can. Yeah, I mean, it's it's okay if you want to go. That's very cute. No, we're going <laughs> to hang out. I think we should do this. This is important. Um, so we'll take a little 15 minute break. We'll come back and solve some problems, okay? All right. Hey, Hamborns, how are you doing? Oh. 
All right. Who mentioned the lab? Which one of the black squares was it? I'm enjoying it. It's fun. I was going to say the same thing, bro. Thanks, bro. All right. Did you see his dog? He's so cute. Thank you.
Okay. I hope everybody had a chance to grab a snack. Take a minute, stretch your legs, breathe your brain. Watch out, King Cat. Professor? Yes. Will we be having any other uh, practice homework problems with uh, the Schaus method, or is it only the ones that we already have? I won't be adding any other required homework problems for the Schaus method. So this is the only homework that you guys are going to get that has those problems in them. Um, but as always, I recommend looking in the textbook for extra practice problems. So the homework that I have found on weather science should be regarded as like the bare minimum. And if you want to master something, you should really spend some time working on extra problems. So I, I would recommend looking in the textbook for a few more. I think I only have like four or five shelf problems in here. Yeah, that's why I asked. So the, if you want more practice, I think that's a, a great thing. There's a whole section in the book on it. And I would certainly recommend looking at more of these problems. I think that's a, a really good thing to do. Um, but I don't want to overwhelm and give you a massive, massive homework set. If I really gave you guys all the homework you, you know, the, the amount of problems I think you really should solve to, to master this, it would be like a 15 hour homework set. And I can't require that of you. But uh, the ethic here is always, you know, solve all the problems, um, or at least as, as many as you possibly can. Miss um, Professor Phil Sticker, um, I don't know if it's just me, but you sound like really muffled. Really? Um, it's definitely just you because you sound like a robot right now. It, oh, really? Okay, it, maybe it's because I have my AirPods on. Okay, let me take them off. Okay. Could be that. Could also be a bandwidth restriction. So my wife is downstairs on Zoom at the moment also. And if you have anything um, that is consuming large amounts of bandwidth, that can, that can result in a lower quality sound or lower quality picture. All right, so the lab periods um, are really intended to be problem solving sessions for you guys. Let me show you something really quickly. Come on. Labs, mini quizzes. So normally I would start a lab in person by handing out a little mini quiz like this. Um, and then I collect these at the end. You don't put your names on them, they're usually anonymous, and it just helps me get a feel for where you guys are at. I am going to upload and share these um, so you guys can take a look, and then you let me know which of these problems you would like to see worked out. So here's what I will do. This is our class, right? So let's go to files. Now you guys can't see the files tab here, so I will upload them, and then send you links. Maybe I should add a folder. Mini quizzes, what I usually do is. Copy link location. You'll need to be signed into Canvas for this link to work, I think. But please uh, look in the chat. I'm going to send out URLs for mini quiz one, which would have been our week one lab, um, the mini quiz to begin the week one lab. And location. So take a look at those documents. These are problems that are intended to be easy. Let me be clear about this. These are not intended to be hard problems. Um, these are kind of basic problems from that week. Now, this mini quiz two, cotangent, x sine two x, yeah. And what is this? Shade the enclosed region, calculate the area. 
maybe even I should include Minicus 3. Uh, professor? Yes. I don't know if anyone else is having this problem, but it's taking me to the Santa Fe homepage, the, the two links. You, you have posted. to be signed into Canvas before yeah, you. Yeah, you got to be signed into Canvas for those four. Okay, thank you. I'll try that. No problem. No problem, Kitty. Well, goddamn, Kitty, what do you want? So if there are any particular homework problems you guys want to look at or any problems from these mini quizzes that you guys would like to look at, um, I would be happy to work any of those with you. Yeah, I'll look over the mini quiz, but um, I think the one that I was having trouble with was, do, 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 hold on, let me try and get it. I think it was eight that I was having trouble with. One of the things that I was struggling with on eight was uh, that the axis of rotation is to the right of the function. Mm -hmm. So I was initially not realizing that, but it's actually supposed to be, what is it, two minus the 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 functions rather than the functions minus two. And that's, that's where I was struggling. Here, yeah. So if you want to find a distance from a line like this to a point over here, you're going to take the x value here minus the x value here. So let's take a look at number eight. This is a 6.2 problem, so we want to be using the disk washer method. The boundary curves here are 8x cubed, y equals 0, x equals 1 and we're rotating about the line x equals 2. 8x cubed is actually a really fast growing function as compared to a lot of others that we look at. We we'll call this line right here x equals 2. Okay, and x equals one. I'll put right here, or not. Okay. So my region is here. I want to rotate like this. I want to rotate about this line. There's a few things that we need to do here. If we're going to use the method of disks and washers, which is what's intended because this is a 6.2 problem, our strip should be drawn in perpendicular to the axis of rotation. So I'm going to show you here the disk washer solution. That is the intended one. Here's my strip. This point along the curve here, where the strip intersects the curve, we could write that as x comma 8x cubed. But the thickness of this strip is a dy thickness. So really what I need to do is get all of my distances in terms of the variable y. So rather than writing, writing this point as x comma 8x cubed, I need to come back here and solve this for y. Oh, sorry, solve this for x so I can write it in terms of y. So this is the same as saying y over 8 equals x cubed. And then you can take cube roots on both sides. So this is the same as saying the cube root of y over 2 is equal to x, because the cube root of 8 is 2. So I can write this as cube root of y over 2 comma y. 
And that's going to be the more useful way to think of that point for the purposes of this problem. So now if I were to rotate just that strip, I would get a big, big washer. Its thickness like this is, is dy. And it has a little inner radius, little r, and a big outer radius. Big R. All right, so if I rotate this strip around this line, like, like this, I'll get something that looks like that. Little r is the distance from the near end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And big R is the distance from the far end of the strip to the axis of rotation. And the catch here is that both of these need to be functions of y. That's the reason we went through this process and rewrote that point like this. I don't know if you guys can read this. I've got a little jumble there. This is the cube root of y over 2 comma y. So who can help me out with little r? Would little r just be like two? It's not going to be two, but it is constant. It's the distance from here to here. Now, this is the vertical line x equals 1. And this is the vertical line x equals 2. So that horizontal distance there is just 1. Oh, OK, so it doesn't matter that it's a little way. Yes, yeah, so yep. and the way we're getting that, I should write this the way I've been writing it. The way we're getting that is as two minus one, right? Which is one, because the, the x value here is two, the x value here is one. What about big R? Two minus the cube root of y over two. Mm -hmm. So wait, why is it going to be two minus the cube root over two rather than the cube root of y over two minus two? because the two is the larger x value, mm -hmm. right? And these distances okay. should be positive. So if I wanna know what is this distance, I take the bigger x value and I subtract the smaller x value. Okay, I can see that. So then my dv will be two minus the cube root of y over two all squared minus one squared. And the thickness there is dy. So we'll have a, a mess of algebra to sort out here, but it's not too bad. When I square this, I'll have two squared, which is four, minus two copies of this times this. So I'll write it like that, two copies of two times the cube root of y over two plus the cube root of y over two all squared. So that's this first guy. And now I need to subtract the one and we still have our dy. I can cancel these twos, and I'll get pi times, 
Well, here I have four minus one, that's three. And then minus two times the cube root of y plus the cube root of y all squared, that's y to the 2 thirds power. And that's being divided by 2 squared, which is 4. So that's how this simplifies. And then we'll need to integrate. So if this is my dv, then v will be the integral of dv taken from where to where? What are my bounds here? And how do I figure them out? From zero to one. Well, remember, <clears throat> This is a dy integral, right? Mm -hmm. you have to imagine this strip as moving through this region. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go in this case from the smallest y value down here up to the largest y value up here. So my smallest y value down here is definitely zero, right? Everywhere along here, y is equal to zero. But up here, what is the y value there? Eight. eight, good, right? We're along the curve y equals eight x cubed. So this is the point one comma eight. So my integral is gonna be running from y equals zero up to y equals eight. And then that is gonna be pi integral zero to eight. This stuff, so that's three minus two cube roots of y plus one fourth y to the two thirds dy. Um, now, the only thing I need to do before I can evaluate this integral is rewrite this cube root of y as a power. That's pi integral zero to eight, three minus two y to the one third plus one fourth y to the two thirds dy. And now my antiderivative will follow from the power rule, nothing crazy. So it'll be three y minus, if I add one to one third, that's one third plus three thirds is four thirds. So I'll have y to the four thirds. And then I need to divide by four thirds. The two will just come along for the ride. I'll write it like this for the time being. Then I'll have plus one fourth. Here, if I add one power, uh, if I add one to this power, uh, two thirds plus three thirds is five thirds. So this will be y to the five thirds divided by five thirds, and all evaluated from zero to eight. Uh, thankfully at zero, all of this stuff is zero. But up there at eight, we've got some work to do. So maybe I'll clean up some of these. This is three y. And then two divided by four thirds is two times three fourths. Uh, that's three halves. So we'll have minus three halves y to the four thirds plus, and something similar here, I'll have uh, three over four times five is three twentieths y to the five thirds, all evaluated between zero and eight. Again, at zero, we get nothing, but at eight, we do need to do some work. This will be three times eight minus three halves times eight to 
to the fourth root plus three twentieths times eight to the five thirds. And the cube root of eight is two, right? The one third power of eight is two. So for this middle term, eight to the four thirds is the same as two to the four. And for this last term, eight to the five thirds is the same as two to the five. Um, I have a quick question. So you know how um, you are at ne like negative two y to the four third and then you divide by four over three. Mm -hmm. So that's like the same thing as multiplying by three over four, right? Correct. So wouldn't it be six over four? Uh, then... Yes, but you can cancel a two. Six over four is the same as three over two. Oh, okay, okay. You're, yeah. you're correct. Yeah, I just, um, I just canceled. No, no yeah, yeah, I don't know why I just didn't. <laughs> Think of it like that, but yeah, I see it now. It's thank okay, you. no worries. No, you're, you're perfect, you're perfect. All right, thank you. Any other concerns up to this step? All right, let's finish our arithmetic then. Three times eight is 24. Eight to the four thirds is two to the four. So this will be minus three halves times 16 plus Three over 20 times eight to the five thirds is two to the five will be 32. And there is more cleaning up that we can do if we want to. This is pi times 24 minus 16 divided by two is eight times three is 24. So those pieces actually go. Plus, uh, what can we do here? 20 is divisible by four. 32 divided by four is eight. So this is, oh, another 24. Oh, that's cute. So the first two 24s cancel. The last 24 survives and we get 24 pi. Well, that's very cute. Okay. Uh, so have you guys had a chance to look over the mini quiz or are there other homework problems y'all would like to look at? Uh, professor, when I try to open the the both links, you open you open me the the same quiz. I can open the the first one. I don't know why. Hmm. Let's see. Let me let me see what we have here. So if I follow those links, what do I get? I pop this guy. Let's open up Firefox. This is that one. Also, when, he, when is the mini quiz due and where do we turn it in? These are not due. Uh, these are things oh, okay. that, that normally I would give out during an in-person lab just to feel out where you guys are in your progress here. Yeah, that's strange. I don't know why that's... In the chat, you posted the same link twice. Yeah, did I copy paste the wrong one? Let's see, files, mini quiz one, copy link location here. Try mini quiz one again. We just have mini quiz two, so we need mini quiz one. Yeah, so here's the first one. This should work. Yeah, there we go. So mini quiz one is all U sub stuff. Uh, one area between curve problem. And then mini quiz two has, uh, I think, just one area between curve problems. Or I just ask you to set it up. And then a couple more. Um, Integrals to evaluate. Both of these are also U sub problems. Actually, this guy, problem three here. I don't don't think you guys know how to do this yet. This is an integration by parts problem. So these are old. These are from before COVID when I used to teach things in a slightly different order. Um, but problem two from mini quiz two you should be able to do. Problem one from mini quiz two you should be able to do, and everything from mini quiz one uh, you should be comfy with. Uh, whatever you guys want to look at, I'm happy to do. Now, if, if you're all super happy and comfy and don't want to do anything, I won't force you to stay here beyond, you know, say another 15 minutes. Can you do number two uh, on mini quiz one? Sure. So here we want to crunch out the integral of 2x times the cos of x squared.
Can anybody give us a little hint? I would make x squared equal to u because 2x is the derivative of x squared. Very good, yeah. So here you notice the substitution, I'll use z if that's okay. The substitution z equals x squared is gonna be really nice here because dz is 2x dx. So it may be helpful to shuffle the 2x to the other side of the cosine. This is cosine of x squared times 2x dx. So right here, you've got dz. which means when I implement that substitution, I will just have cosine of z dz. So what do I do from there? Integrate like normal. So what is the integral of cos z dz? Sine z, z, sine z. Good, yeah, this is sine of z. And I add on my plus c because it's an indefinite integral. And then one last step. Sub the x squared in for the z. Good. And if I wanted to check my work, how would I do that? Differentiate. Very good. So if I want to check, I would apply the operator ddx to sine of x squared plus c. The plus c will differentiate to zero. The sine of x squared will differentiate to cosine of x squared times the derivative of x squared. That's the chain rule. And then the derivative of x squared is 2x. So is this what we started with? Yes, it is, right? 2x times cos of x squared. What else would we like to see? Anything you've been worrying about? Homework question 13. Sure. From homework two? Yeah. Can we still even see homework one? Um, I believe you are able to open it for review purposes, but um, but I don't think you should be able to submit new answers unless you put in an extension request. If you requested an extension, then I will have pushed it to um, next week. So number 13 here says to use cylindrical shells to find the volume generated by rotating the region bounded by y equals 5x squared and y equals 30x minus 10x squared about the y-axis. So we start by drawing our region. I'll just copy this down real quick. All right, so we know we want to use the method of cylindrical shells. We should take a look at what these graphs are. Um, to, to help with that, I'm going to factor 10x out from this first guy. And what's left will be 3 minus x. So my first guy is like x squared, just stretched vertically by a factor of 5. And my second guy is a parabola opening down, having uh, x-intercepts at 0 and 3. So this region, 5x squared, something like that. And then let's call this 1, 2, 3. So the guy, I'm going to exaggerate this height here quite a bit just to help us have a little more space to work. So here's what we're looking at. Our region is like this. And I want to rotate about the y-axis. 
So I'll come in, I'm using the shells method. So I'm gonna draw my strip parallel to the axis of rotation, which means here my strip will be oriented up and down like this vertically. I just found my mistake. No, oh, it still doesn't hurt to go through the process. So what would I do next? Uh, I set the equations equal to each other to find the bounds. We'll need that, yep. We are, because my region is defined by these intersection points. One of them uh, is clearly zero because these are both zero and zero, but to find the other one, to find the intersections, we solve. 5x squared equals 30x minus 10x squared. We can add, uh, I pull everything over to one side, and that'll give me 15x squared minus 30x equals 0. And we can factor out a 15x here, and what will be left is just x minus, oops, x minus 2. So this guy is, oh, I almost drew it right. This guy is two. All right. What else do I need to set up my volume integral using the shells method? Height mm -hmm. and radius. Good. So we know that dv for the shells method is two pi rh times, in this case, dx. My radius, r, is this, and my height, h, is this. So that's 2 pi times what is r and what is h? r is x. Good, because the horizontal h. distance from here to here is just x, and h? h is the upper function minus the lower function. Good, and this is my upper function. This is my lower function, right? You know that. And that was a mistake I made. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. So H here would be 30X minus 10X squared minus 5X squared. So that's gonna be 30X minus 15X squared. So this will be two pi X, times 30x minus 15x squared dx. And then volume is the integral of dv taken in this case from x equals zero to x equals two because zero is the smallest x value in here and two is the largest. So that will be integral zero to two of two pi x times 30 x minus 15 x squared dx. So two pi can come out. And what's left is integral zero to two, 30 x squared minus 15 x cubed dx. And so that will be 2 pi times my antiderivative here. x squared will become x cubed over 3. The 30 and the 1 third will talk to each other. That'll be 10x cubed minus x cubed will become x to the 4 over 4 and 15 over 4, they don't talk to each other. So that's just 15 over 4 x to the 4. And all this is to be evaluated from 0 to 2. At 0 again, everything here is 0. So my only contribution comes from up here. 10 times 2 cubed is 10 times 8. So that's 80 minus 15 fourths times 2 to the 4. I'll just write it like that for now. 2 to the 4 is 16. And then 16 divided by 4 is 4. So there is some easy cleaning up to do here. This is 80 minus 15 times 4. 
Uh, 15 times 4 is 60, 80 minus 60 is 20, so this is 2 pi times 20 or 40 pi. Okay. All right. Uh, questions on this fellow? Yeah. Can you can you explain why you get that on the H that formula on mm -hmm. H? On the high, yeah. So let's look a little more closely at this picture. I'll redraw it here, kind of zoomed in on that region. So this curve is y equals 30x minus um, 10x squared. And this guy is y equals 5x squared. So if I want to find the height of a strip in here, I need to subtract the y values Now, a y value along this curve at an arbitrary position x down here is, well, that point there is x comma 30x minus 10x squared. And down here, this is x comma 5x squared. So to find this height, I have to take the y value up here minus the y value down here. So that height is 30x minus 10x squared minus 5x squared. And uh, when you subtract those, you get 30x minus 15x squared. So that's where my height is coming from. OK, thank you. Of course, of course. What else would we like to see? All right, I can smell the malaise. So I don't want to push you guys into uh, spending time here you don't want to spend, but let me show you one more problem. And I'll say this with a, a little warning, my tongue planted firmly in my cheek. Some variation on this problem has shown up on my exam one for pretty much every Calc 2 I've taught in the last five years. I set up integrals for the volume of the solid generated, blah, blah, blah. Boundary curves here, something like y equals ln of x from one less than or equal to x, less than or equal to e, rotated about something like x equals negative one. It's not always ln x. But it's always some function that you guys should know. Ln x, e to the x, sine x, cos x, one of the basic guys. Um, and then always some non um, coordinate axes line here. So I think I talked about the graph of ln x way back on day one. But if that's not in your head nice and firm, here it is. Looks like this.
this graph and the graph of e to the x. These are all things that we really need to know. One is here. The point up here would be e comma one. Right? This is what ln x looks like. And this would be our region then. The y in negative one, x equals negative one would be over here. And I would want to rotate around like this. So I don't want to give the whole thing away because again, some variation on this does show up in pretty much all of my exam ones in this class. Take the time to try and set up these integrals using both methods. Okay. <clears throat> So you'll need to draw this graph once for each of the methods, right? Because your strip is gonna go in either like this for the shells method or like this for the disk washer method. When it comes time to do the disk washer method, you're going to need to characterize a point on this curve in terms of the variable y. So that point, you can write it as x comma ln x, or if you solve y equals ln x for x, you'll find that that's the same as saying x equals e to the y. So another way to describe this point would be e to the y comma y. And I'll leave you guys here for today. All right, so take the time to set up these integrals both ways. If you do run into any questions or uncertainties about how to do that, you can send me a message on Canvas or talk to me in office hours. Um, I'll run through a handful of problems like this before our exam one as a, as a matter of review. Um, but I just want to warn you that you really need to know the natural log graph. You really need to know the graph of the e to the x, sine x, cos of x. Arctan is a big one in this class. You've got to know what the graph of the inverse tangent function looks like. All of those kind of foundational um, transcendental functions. Here's Arctan. He has a horizontal asymptote up here, which is pi over two, and a horizontal asymptote down here, which is negative pi over two. On exam one, you can expect a volume problem that is solvable only if you know the basic graphs that you need to know for this class. Um, and I always try to warn people to try and scare you into like going back and learning those basic graphs. So please take that seriously. It's something we're going to use throughout the semester routinely. Graphs of ln x, graph of r tan x, graph of e to the x, sine x, cos of x, secant x, tangent x, all of those. Um, these are very easy because I, I'm not even going to require you to evaluate the integral. You just got to set it up. But you do have to know these graphs. Um, and you got to be comfortable rewriting these points. So I'll leave it here. I'll let you guys chew on this for a little bit. Next Tuesday, we're going to start talking about um, methods for integration. So we'll talk about integration by parts. And once we talk about integration by parts, I'll be able to solve this specific problem for you all the way. Uh, the reason I'm asking you to set it up and not solve right now is because we don't know how to solve those integrals yet. Um, one of them you can solve. I'll spoil it for you now. You can do this one with disks and washers. You draw your strip in like this. And you guys actually know how to do that integral right now. Um, but if you try to set this up using cylindrical shells, the resulting integral is one we won't know how to do until next Tuesday when I show you IBP. So please work hard finishing up these homework sets. If you do run into any trouble, come see me in office hours. I have an office hour um, tomorrow. I will not have an office hour on Monday. Monday is Dr. King's birthday and the college is closed, so I'm not allowed to do anything um, official on that day. But I will see you all next Tuesday, and um, that is it. All right. Thank you guys for hanging out here. I know energy is a little bit low. I really do appreciate your stick to itiveness, and uh, I'll see you all next week. Have a great day, Professor Falster. You. you too, guys. Bye. Bye.